we're learning to build a website that looks good on all your screens. Responsive design, coming up. Hey, I'm Mark Lassoff and welcome to the channel. I create videos that help you develop professional level coding and design skills. If you like that type of thing, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. We come out with new videos each week to help you learn professional level design and development skills. Today, I've got a really exciting video for you. We're gonna be talking about responsive design. Responsive design is the idea that you should be able to design your digital media, your websites, etc., to look good across the wide variety of screens that are used today. From the smallest mobile phone to the largest television, we can code our digital media correctly so it will look good across all those different screens. I'm going to be going over a couple of different tenets of responsive design. I'm going to be talking about how we actually accomplish responsive design. I'm going to be talking about the specific HTML and CSS code that we use. And then I'm going to be looking at a couple of responsive CSS libraries that do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and download the tools that we're going to be using to test our responsive designs in this video. Aside from your text editor, and you can use whatever text editor you'd like, the tool I'm going to be using to demonstrate responsive design and a great tool for testing responsive design is the Blisk browser. Blisk actually sponsored this video and I'm glad that they did. Blisk allows us to emulate the screens of dozens of different mobile devices and see exactly how our digital media, our HTML, CSS, and JavaScript will look on those individual screens. You're going to want to download it as well. I've put the URL on the bottom of the screen. Go ahead and pause the video now, go to that URL, download and install the Blisk browser because we're working with it throughout our workshop. Once you install and run Blisk browser, it works pretty much like any other browser you've used. You can navigate within a site and interact with the site just as you normally would. I'm on the site for frameworktv.com here. The magic of Blisk Browser happens when you go into developer mode. You toggle developer mode by clicking this button here in the upper left hand corner. Once you go into developer mode, you see this set of options up here. These options are designed to help you build sites from a multi device perspective. From the device set, we can define different sets of devices through which to view a site. We'll do that in a moment. The view menu has your view options, for example, going into full screen mode. Capture allows you to actually take a screenshot of a device set or record video. You can turn on auto refresh mode. That'll allow sites to refresh automatically when the code changes in a specific folder. That can be very, very useful. And then of course we have a tools menu that includes an image editor. Here's where you'll set up your Blisk account if you wish to get a premium account. And then we have the different Blisk settings that are available to you if you want to change the default settings in the browser. Let's start by creating a device set. I'm going to click device set and new set. And now I'm going to choose the devices that I want. Now, if you scroll through here, you'll notice there are a number of different devices that you can test on. The devices are also categorized here. For example, we have our iOS devices, our Android devices, all of our tablets, and our desktops. I'm actually going to choose two iOS devices and also a Chrome-like desktop view. So we'll see what the website looks like in Chrome. Let's use the iPhone X and let's find our iPad mini. There we go. So notice the three selected devices are here. As soon as I click launch devices, we're going to see three separate instances of our site. And you can see some of the responsive design features of frameworktv.com immediately. And what's happened here is as we emulate these three devices, we've actually launched separate instances of the website. As I scroll, you'll notice it attempts to scroll and show you what that position looks like in each of our devices. Here you can see the no exam certification section of our website looks different in the Chrome-like desktop view at 634 by 940 pixels, our iPhone X and our tablet. 
this gives you just a hint of how we can use the Blisk browser to adjust and perfect our responsive designs. I think a good place to start our discussion is with a couple of formal definitions of responsive design, just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. So this first definition comes from interactivedesign.org. Responsive design is a graphic user interface design approach used to create content that adjusts smoothly to various screen sizes. Designers size elements in relative units, that's percentage, and apply media queries so their designs can automatically adapt to the browser space to ensure content consistency across devices. I really like that definition. It seems to encapsulate the whole thing, but let's look at just one more. So this was written by Clarissa Peterson on O'Reilly's site. Responsive design overall is a way to make websites that can be easily viewed on any type of device and size of screen, all the way from the smallest mobile phones up to the widest desktop monitors. I've brought up the site from Dutch company Kimi Aviation in our Blisk browser. I've got three versions of the site showing. I've got the Chrome-like desktop version, I've got the iPhone X version, and the iPad mini version. This site is designed with responsive design. We can see some of the responsive design features at the very top of the website. If you look at the text at the bottom of the screens, notice the layout is different in each of the three screens. If we look at the menuing, it's different in the three viewports. For example, in the Chrome screen, we can see the Our Priorities link, the Get Inspired link, the Book Now link, and the email icon. To reveal those options in the mobile versions, both on the iPhone and iPad, we've got to click the menu link. And there you can see Home, Our Priorities, Get Inspired, and Book Now. The menuing is identical in the tablet version. As we navigate through the sites, we can see different sections of the site are similar and different in the different devices. Here, this particular section of the site didn't require a lot of responsive design work between the different browser widths. The Our Priorities section of the site has only slight differences between the three browsers. Notice the placement of the word safety in the Chrome desktop and in the mobile devices. The Comfort section shows how responsive typography is used to optimize the viewing experience in all three browsers. The footer of the website also shows some differences in typography to optimize the experience for different viewports. Let's look at the responsive design in one more site. I'm gonna to go to municipal.com. And here as we scroll through the site, you can see the similarities and differences in the layout. You can see the layout on the mobile devices is fairly similar, but there are some typographical differences between the tablet and the phone. The Chrome version has a more spacious layout with text and images side by side. You can see that for the mobile devices, more of a single column strategy was used. Notice here on the Chrome desktop, hats and shorts are next to each other, left and right side. But on the mobile devices, you've got to scroll to see both of those because they're in a single column. So this particular e-commerce site makes very good use of responsive design to provide a good experience regardless of the size of your viewport. There are several facets to responsive design. The first of which is fluid grids. A fluid grid layout or fluid grid system provides a visual way to create different layouts corresponding to devices on which the website is displayed. So if your website's gonna be viewed on a desktop, you're gonna have one type of grid that lays out the website one way, and the grid might be completely different for a mobile device, showing less features or changing the arrangement of the features within a site. You can use fluid grid layouts to specify layouts for each individual device. That definition of fluid grids comes from adobe.com. The second major aspect of responsive design is scaling all content. And that ensures that all content fits in the viewport horizontally. You never wanna have your user scrolling horizontally in responsive design. Vertical scrolling people are used to and it's okay. An image that's displayed at a wider width than the viewport, essentially the size of your screen, can cause the viewport to scroll horizontally. Remember, we don't want that. So we should adjust that content to fit within the width of the viewport so that the user never needs to scroll horizontally. Scale all content to the width of the viewport. That's our second major tenant 
of responsive design. The third major tenant of responsive design is image optimization. Now in web development, image optimization has always been important because we don't want to have super high resolution images that take a long time to download displayed on the screen when they're going to be displayed in a lower resolution, just wasting time and bandwidth. So in responsively designed websites, images need to scale to fit the screen, whether it's desktop, tablet, or phone screen, without slowing down the site. There's a couple of different techniques that are used to optimize images for responsive design, and all of them end up in allowing the image to quickly scale to fit the available screen size and viewport. Another tenant of responsive design is the ability to preview for specific devices. Blisk Browser makes this process easy. Blisk Browser includes dozens of specific devices that we can choose from. We can simply create a new device set and choose the devices that we'd like to test on. So this is our YouTube channel page. I'm going to test this one on the Google Pixel, an iPad 10, and a 1200 by 800 Windows laptop. Once the devices are launched, we can see the results on these specific devices. You're always going to want to test your individual responsive designs on as many device types as possible. The last major tenant of responsive design is mobile first design. For the old guys like me, this one's kind of hard to get used to because for so many years we were designing for that wider screen. But now it's really recommended that we design for mobile first. The mobile first design is a philosophy that aims to create better experiences for users by starting the design process from the smallest of screens, mobile screens, and then designing and prototyping websites for the larger screens later. Prototyping websites for mobile devices first helps you ensure that your user's experience is seamless on any device. That comes from envisionapp.com. If we want to employ responsive design, the first thing we have to do is add our viewport meta tag to the head section of our HTML. You can see a typical viewport meta tag here. We use the tag meta, and then there are two attributes. The name, of course, is going to be viewport. And then the content attribute is going to contain a couple of different viewport rules or how we want to set up our viewport. Most of the time, you're going to set it up like this with a width that equals the device width. That means the width of our application is going to be the same as the width of the viewport or screen. And we're going to set an initial scale of 1.0 or essentially a magnification of 100%. Let's take a look at the results of using the viewport tag. Here in Blisk Browser, you can see we're running our website here in the iPad Mini, a regular Chrome browser, and then we're also emulating an iPhone. And if you look at the text at the bottom, the text seems to be running off the side of the screen. And that's because we don't have our viewport set up. The viewport essentially is going to be as wide as it needs to be to accommodate the content. But then if we go into the code and remove the comments from the viewport meta tag, so the viewport meta tag is processed, now let's take a look at the results. And now you can see everything fits neatly on the screen, no matter which screen we're using. We're getting consistent results that look good within our iPad mini, within our Chrome web browser, and within our iPhone. Even with our viewport set up, we still need to set up our images to be responsive. Here's the code that we use. It's pretty straightforward. All we're doing is in the style sheet, setting the images to a width of, in this case, 100%. The key is we're using a percentage-based width, not a pixel-based width. So this way, it's going to fill 100% of the viewport on any size screen. And you can see there, this is applied to the image tag, just like the image tag you see here in the code. Now, if we take a look at this example, I've got an image that is much too big for any of these viewports. This image is actually 1,920 pixels wide. Now, right now, I don't have the appropriate code for responsive design with this image. If we go in and we remove the comments from the code and we go back to our Blisk browser, you can see that now the image looks great and fits in all three of our devices. It looks great in our emulated iPad mini, in our emulated Chrome browser, and also in our iPhone X. 
So with just a little bit of code, we can make our images responsive. Now keep in mind, all our images don't have to be at 100%. Just as long as they're a consistent percentage, it could be 50%, for example, they're going to work responsively and never force the user to horizontally scroll to see the entire image. Now, with responsive design, we want to make sure our images look good and load quickly on different size screens. That means sometimes we're loading a much bigger image than we need for mobile devices. And with mobile devices that might be on a cell signal, we still can have very limited bandwidth. So one thing to solve this issue is the picture tag. This is a fairly new tag that I actually didn't know much about. The picture tag lets us set up different image sources for different screen sizes. So here you can see we've got our picture tag. And inside the picture tag, we have two other tags. The first tag is a source tag. And what this source tag says is we're going to load the file surfer240200.jpg when this media query is true. In this case, a minimum width of 800 pixels. So that particular source, that surfer image, will only load when our screen is a minimum width of 800 pixels. Now, if our viewport doesn't meet that criteria, it's going to fall back to the image tag, and it's going to load painted hand 298.332. So the picture tag actually lets us set up multiple sources for images that will load based on various queries. If the media query is true, it will load the related image. Here you can see the result of the code we just examined, displayed in three different viewports. Notice the viewport for the iPhone X and the iPad mini display one image, while the wider Chrome-like desktop viewport displays another. You'll remember from the code that our breakpoint was at 800 pixels. The Chrome desktop is 807 pixels wide, while the iPhone desktop is 375 pixels wide the iPad mini giving us a viewport of 768 pixels. If we were to rotate the iPad so the viewport is 1,024 pixels wide, watch what happens. Now we're displaying the alternate image. Generally, you would use different versions of the same image, but I wanted to use two distinct images here so you can see exactly how the picture tag worked and the results in different width viewports. If we've got our viewport set up and we've got our images acting responsively, the next thing we need to deal with is our typography. And of course, there's a way to do responsive typography. Here I have an example of responsive typography. In our H1, you can see the font size is 10VW. And for our paragraph style, you can see the font size is 5VW. Now, you're probably used to styling your type with size measured in points and picas or even pixels. Whatever system you use, this is the appropriate measurement system to use for responsive design. VW means viewport width. One VW is 1% of the width of the viewport. So 10 VWs means 10% of the width of the viewport. Now the point is here that these viewport width measurements will scale your text. So as the viewport gets bigger, the text gets bigger. As the viewport gets smaller, the text gets smaller in proportion to the width of your viewport. Here you can see the code we just looked at running in the Blisk browser. And we can see the result in three different viewports. Now, as we adjust the size of the viewport, you can see the actual size of the text changing, getting bigger as the viewport gets wider and smaller as the viewport gets narrower. Now, what's important to note, though, is that our body text and our headline text retain their proportions to each other, with our headline text being 10 VWs, roughly twice as big as our body text. So this is a great way to create typography that's going to be compliant with the ideals of responsive design. Perhaps the most important aspect of HTML and CSS for responsive design is media queries. Media queries allow us to address CSS rules to specific conditions in the viewport. Let's write one and see how they work. You'll notice that in the body selector, I have a background color of white. So our background color for this particular page will be white. But I'm going to change that based on our media query. 
Media queries always start with the at rule, at media. There are other at rules in CSS, at media is probably the most common. We then have a media type, our media type is screen, as opposed to using print or speech as a media type. We then have our and operator, and we're gonna set a media feature of a minimum width of 320 pixels. I'm gonna set one more media feature, so I need an and operator again, and I'm gonna do a maximum width using max width of 768 pixels. So there's our query. It'll apply when the screen width is between 320 and 768 pixels. Now in here, I can write CSS selectors and rules for the changes I wanna see when our media query is applied, when the viewport is between 320 and 768 pixels. I'm gonna use the body selector and I'm gonna set the background color to green. So when this media query is applied, it's gonna apply this singular CSS rule, setting the background color to green on our body. Loading this document into Blisk Browser, you can see the result right here. Our Chrome section for the Chrome-like desktop is the only one of the three that is outside of the range of the media query. We're at 817 pixels wide, which is wider than where the media query applies. However, both the iPhone X and the iPad mini are within the range of our media query. If I rotate the iPad mini, it's now 1,024 pixels wide, bringing it outside the range of the media query, so the green background is not applied. Let's add one more selector and CSS rule to our media query. For our H2s, I'm going to set a color of blue. So now we have multiple rules being applied when our media query is active. Again, when the viewport's between 320 and 768 pixels wide. Once again, you can see our result in Blisk Browser. If we were to rotate our iPad mini again, so it is 768 pixels wide, you can see that our H2 text, Westport, Connecticut, has again turned blue. I thought we'd take a look at the frameworktv.com site for a good example of media queries at work. I have my Blisk browser set up, so we have a regular Chrome browser on the left, and on the right we've got an iPhone 10. And you can see some of the subtle differences in the site as we scroll through it. You'll notice, for example, that in the Chrome version of the site, we have multiple items in a row but those items are collapsed into a single column when we look at this in our mobile device. You'll also notice subtle differences in the typography and the layout of the site, making the experience equally good for both our mobile users and our desktop users. We actually also have a tablet version. We have a media query for tablets that gives us a third layout that's optimized for the tablet view. There are a number of CSS libraries or frameworks that do a lot of the heavy lifting with responsive design for you. These generally have grid systems that are compatible with responsive design that allow you to lay out your site different ways for different size screens. We're gonna take a look at two of these. We're gonna look at w3.css and the most popular of these CSS libraries, Bootstrap. W3.css is an easy to use CSS library that's got great responsive features. One of the interesting things about CSS is that it's fairly lightweight. The code base is smaller than its main competitor, Bootstrap. It also doesn't use any jQuery or any JavaScript libraries. So if you're looking for a thin, lightweight library, you might want to consider W3.css. The way w3.css works is it breaks your website into a number of containers. There's a container class, and then each of these containers is automatically responsive. You can change the content of the containers, and you can configure the containers by using specialized classes from the library. The library also has a number of other features, including cards and quotes and tables that are styled specifically for the library, all of which are responsive. 
This is a CSS only library in that all of the code under the hood is in CSS. Bootstrap is actually the most popular CSS library in use today. It's deployed on millions of sites. The advantage of that is there is a huge community that's available to answer questions and help you learn the technology. If you're getting started with Bootstrap, Bootstrap actually has a themes marketplace. That includes a number of pre-written themes that you can download and take advantage of the responsive design features and also the graphic and digital design that's been done for you. Bootstrap allows you to configure breakpoints in your design, similar to media queries. It also comes with pre-configured breakpoints from small at 576 pixels to extra extra large at 1400 pixels. You can then indicate changes you want to make in Bootstrap for the available breakpoints. Perhaps Bootstrap's strongest feature are the components. It's got components for elements like accordions, badges, breadcrumbs, buttons, and carousels. These are easy to use and are all congruent with the Bootstrap look and feel. Of course, all of these components are responsive, so you don't have to do any additional work to make sure they work on different size viewports. So there you have it, the fundamentals of responsive design. I'd really like to thank Blisk Browser, first of all, for producing such a great tool for responsive design testing, but also for sponsoring this video. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. We come out with new videos each week to help you become a professional developer or designer. My name is Mark Lassoff. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.